We're joining the service in progress today at the First Church of the Last Chance. The Reverend Jim Tater is speaking after this musical interlude. has a very touchy subject today that uh, many members of the congregation, we're afraid, may actually get up and walk out on this message. But this is a message that the Reverend really feels strongly about, and we hope you enjoy this message today. On the Jim and Tater Show, KOOT 88.1 FM, Hurley, New Mexico. University professor asked his graduating seniors if you were faced with the following situation. A pregnant woman with nine children and a history of severe mental illness on both sides of her family has already suffered three miscarriages. Syphilis has been reported on her mother's side of the tree. There is a better than even chance that she'll die in childbirth. Three of her nine children are mentally or physically challenged. Even if this child survives, it will likely be raised in poverty and want at the hands of a drunken and abusive father. This woman has been referred to you for medical advice. Under these circumstances, would you abort this baby? 92% of the students said yes, to which the professor replied, Congratulations, you just aborted Beethoven. Abortion may be the single most controversial question of our time, and it quickly divides people, creating high levels of emotion. It puts families and entire communities at odds and allows little fence riding. You're either for it or against it, and no one remains neutral. I believe America will be finished as a great nation if we fail to resolve this issue one way or the other, once and for all. My position has changed since Roe v. Wade. Once I believed that abortion was a decision best left between a woman and her doctor. I felt compassion on two former friends in the 80s and provided them with the financial means to obtain abortions. I defended pro-choice with great zeal as so many have done for so long. Unfortunately, my compassion was misplaced and my thinking was misguided by facts that were untrue and experts who were intellectually dishonest. In the late 60s and early 70s when the controversy began, as a young liberal Democrat I believed abortion was simply a matter of personal choice. I recall the great debates at the universities and in the media between well-respected physicians and other experts. The doctor who started the National Abortion Rights Action League, NARAL, and speakers from the women's movement debated the pro-lifers, and that now seems to have been a catalyst for legalizing abortion. Those experts told us life does not begin until the end of the third trimester. They told us that the fetus felt no pain. They told us there was no other option in cases of rape and incest. They told us it was no different than any other surgical procedure. But the facts and truth as they presented them were questionable at best. 
20 years later, I saw the same doctor on the 700 Club. He said he left NARAL several years before and had done a complete about face on his abortion stance. And he said in the beginning it was all just about money. The truth was that in order to find a way to create an industry around abortion, a group of doctors, lawyers, and business leaders came together and lied to us so we would become accepting of the wholesale slaughter of our children. He said they knew the American people would never accept abortion on demand, so they coined the term pro-choice. The idea of killing or aborting babies would be impossible to sell to America, so they committed to using the terms fetus or fetal tissue. And they coined phrases like termination and viability of the fetus. With the discovery of DNA and the number of babies now surviving earlier in the second and third trimester, he said, we must revisit the case law. After hearing his testimony to the fraud that has been perpetrated on us, I became outraged and extremely saddened that we had made such an important decision based on fraudulent data. And I decided to do whatever I could to undo this national nightmare. I believe the answer to our national stalemate will be found in the United States Constitution because the law is the tool that separates us from barbarism. It is the arbiter for resolving our differences and the protector from doing harm to one another. Law establishes the foundation from which free people can defend and govern themselves and their affairs. You weaken that foundation even slightly and the future is at risk. I believe the most important constitutional principle that separates us from the barbarian is the protection of the innocent. Never has it been found as well defined and applicable as in our Constitution. The right of a trial by jury of your peers to be faced by your accusers, guilt proven beyond a reasonable doubt, protection against double jeopardy, cruel and unusual punishment, due process and protection against unlawful searches and seizures. All of these were woven into the Constitution in order to limit the possibility of being imprisoned for a crime you did not commit, and to protect the innocent from grievous harm by others. In a court of law, minor children are represented by an attorney ad litem. Doesn't it seem appropriate that someone should speak for the unborn children as well? Recently, a doctor was performing an abortion on a 17-week fetus, and the procedure failed, and the baby survived. This little girl is alive today and about to celebrate her third birthday. Is she less of a human being because she was born at 17 weeks? Was she entitled to constitutional protection for the remainder of her second and third trimester? Can we now agree that life probably begins at least at 17 weeks, contrary to Roe v. Wade? Isn't it time to revisit these cases since the facts on the ground have changed? Are we unwilling to admit that the facts have changed in the last 40 years? Now that we've proven that more than half of all abortions are a matter of convenience or birth control, can we as a nation ever have a clear conscience regarding the destruction of so many of our own kind? Who will speak for those unable to speak for themselves? Have the law and the Constitution only been created to protect those fortunate enough to survive the first nine months of their life? I appeal on behalf of reason and common sense to consider the importance of protecting the innocent. If the foundation of our nation rests upon a principle that protects the innocent and then becomes impotent in protecting the most innocent among us, aren't we as a people doomed to become uncivilized barbarians? Benjamin Franklin, after signing the Declaration of Independence, remarked, We must all hang together or most assuredly we shall hang separately. Thomas Jefferson in his opening said, We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and endowed by that Creator with the unalienable right to life. The first line of the Constitution reads, We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, has our union now 
been made more perfect by the extermination of 50 million of our brothers and sisters? Akin to the revulsion felt at the discovery of the horror at Auschwitz and Treblinka, the silence of these children should be a deafening roar waking a comatose nation to action. We can never know if that next aborted child could have been the one, given time and circumstances, that found the cure for AIDS or cancer. As the good professor queried, what would you do? Would you abort Beethoven? Bye.